astrographer, I am really interested in ways that we can work to combat the issue of climate change. Over the last two years, I have joined and organised expeditions to the Himalayas and Greenland to look at how the rising air temperatures have impacted both the natural landscape and local people of these areas. And I have been shocked by how quickly the landscape is changing, but also by how differently people are being affected by it. In the Himalayas, people are experiencing a very adverse impact of water shortages as glaciers disappear. Whereas in Greenland, people are having a very positive response through tourism, farming, and the boost to the local economy. So with an issue that's so diverse and has people divided across the world, how do we move forward? Today, I'd like to share with you stories of my past adventures and go on to suggest ways in which art can be used to engage more people with environmental issues and to inspire action. So with climate change, it all begins with ice. Ice is not only incredibly important because it regulates the global processes of sea level and climate, but also acts on a local scale. The glaciers and ice sheets are very connected to the landscape around them. As ice flows, it exerts a huge erosive force, creating the hills and mountains that we can see today. And as ice melts, the meltwater rivers cut huge valleys across the landscape. So as human actions cause these processes to change, there are knock-on impacts across the world. So my story begins in 2013. I had just left high school and I embarked on my first major expedition with the British Exploring Society to the Indian Himalayas. We flew to Ladakh, which is a region there that is a huge mountainous wilderness that stretches across most of northern India. Here, the locals have a very strong connection with their landscape, both spiritually and religiously. And the landscape itself is a high altitude desert. Therefore, there is very little rainfall received each year. Because of this, locals rely solely on glacial meltwater to supply water for farming and agriculture, one of the biggest industries in the area. But climate change is threatening this, and has caused glaciers to recede to nothing more than snow-capped peaks that we can see now. What were once huge glaciers of filled valleys are now just snow patches clinging to nearby summits, and climate change threatens these to disappear altogether. In some places, this has already happened. The valley that we can see here was once filled by glaciers, and now the glaciers supplying the valley with water have all vanished. The river channel that you can see in the centre here is actually dry, and that has left the locals there without any access to water. The indigenous people that lived here are having to divert water and rivers from other valleys to supply them with water. This is a small scale approach, but this is also happening on a much larger scale with multi-million US dollar projects diverting rivers such as the Indus River. But perhaps one of the most uh, startling uh, ways that locals are adapting is through artificial glaciers. The locals in Ladakh are having to make their own glaciers through freezing water in winter and letting it melt periodically in summer to create the water that they need. And with an economy that's struggling as much as this is in Ladakh, climate change poses a huge threat. So coming away from this trip, I felt really inspired to see what I could do. I no one was talking about these issues in the UK, and I thought, what can I do to bring them to light? So with people that I met at Glasgow University, we organised our own expedition with the aim of communicating what we discovered about climate change. So my story of exploring climate change was to continue in Greenland, in the Arctic. Last summer, in 2014, we flew to the west coast, to the town of Kangalusuak. From there, we travelled east, to the Russell Glacier and Greenland Ice Sheet, where we set up base camp and began our studies. The ice sheet here is incredibly important. In the Himalayas, we saw very small glaciers and exhibited very small-scale change. But here in Greenland, we saw huge glaciers that had a much larger visible change. The Russell Glacier is one of the main outlets of the Greenland Ice Sheet. This is an area that covers 80% of the land area in Greenland, so it's very important that we understand this. The big change that we saw was that the Russell Glacier had receded 30 metres in the last 10 years. And with global climate being the hottest ever in 2014, we can only expect this to be larger in future. We wanted to study exactly how this was changing and exactly how our actions were impacting the landscape there. One of the main ways this happens is through glacial cabins. This is when huge chunks of ice break off from the glaciers and fall into the rivers nearby. To measure this, we used a process called time-lapse photography. We took a series of robust time-lapse cameras and stationed them around the glaciers there. We could program them to take pictures at set time intervals for the duration of our stay. 
And once we were back in the UK, we were able to stitch these photos together to create a fast motion account of the 2014 Summer Millet. Based on previous studies, we expected to see sporadic calving events, with some ice breaking off occasionally contributing to the recession of glaciers in summer. But what we actually saw was a continuous calving. Ice was always breaking off. At night, we could hear the constant crumble and rumble of ice as it broke off into the, into the nearby rivers. And because of this, glaciers aren't advancing enough in winter to counteract the summer melt, so we're continuously retreating. And another way that ice melts that provides a much faster response is through meltwater floods. As ice flows across the top of the ice sheet and meltwater, it forms rivers and lakes. But unlike rivers and lakes that we're used to, the flow over rock, the ice that supports these melts. And as it melts, these, it causes huge volumes of water to go cascading into local rivers. This causes flash floods that have a huge erosive force and pose an incredible danger to anyone living or working nearby. So for us, when we went to Greenland, we wanted to study exactly how this was impacting people. We knew of an event in 2012 that had caused a local bridge to be washed away from one of these floods, and it had to be rebuilt. For locals, this bridge provided them with fresh water and an access across the river, so we thought it would be impacting them very adversely. We spoke to a group of people in Greenland, several people, and we asked them a question. How is climate change affecting your life? And the responses we got were very surprising. People were actually having a very positive experience of climate change. One of the first ways they told us was through farming. Due to the warming climate and the land areas that are opening up as glaciers recede, climate, ch uh, climate change has resulted in farming being able to be practiced in Greenland. This is currently the case in the south of the country, and it is expected to happen in Kangalusuak very soon. In a country that is so sparsely populated and barren, this could provide a fantastic opportunity to create a product to export which would boost the local economy and be a fantastic new industry there. But without a doubt, the biggest way that people in Greenland were being affected positively with climate change was through tourism. Climate change has put places like Greenland on the map. After all, that's the same reason we went there. Each year, thousands of scientists and tourists alike travel to areas such as Greenland to see the melting ice, to study it, and to see the last chance to see glaciers there. Whilst in the country, they'll go to use local tour operators, go on excursions, stay overnight in hotels and hostels in town, as well as going to shops and restaurants. This is fueling the local economy, providing a huge boost. And the towns have had to adapt to this, potentially at the result of westernisation and loss of their local culture. To accommodate the influx of tourists, local people's shops and industries are changing. I think this is an example of how people see the short-term benefits, but are not completely sure of the long-term implications. So when we saw this, this was not what we expected at all. I expected to see similar things to the Himalayas, people having a very negative response that they could communicate. But I came away shocked. This is not what we expected people to be having. And in a way that I think really exemplifies the short-term impacts people see is in one of the many rubbish dumps surrounding the town. Here, we saw a collection of up to 100 oil drums that we've seen deposited and laid to waste. For locals, this provides a fantastic short-term benefit. They need to get rid of their waste, and this is a great way to do so. But they don't see the long-term environmental impacts of their actions. And this is the same way that they interact with climate change. So coming away from this expedition, I, I didn't know what to think. And as I travelled home, I found myself asking the question, how do you approach people in places like Kangaroo in the Arctic about climate change, when so far their experience has been so positive? To find a solution to climate change, we need to give a global response as it's a global issue. But people are divided across the world. I think the next steps we can give to this issue are studying it more, looking at exactly how people put value on the landscape, but also how to connect communities between Greenland, the Himalayas, the UK, and ultimately the wider world. So thinking about that, that's the bigger picture, but what can we do now? I think the most important thing that we can be doing is to communicate these issues ourselves. So far, science has been one of the main ways to communicate this, but I don't think alone that can go any further. The graphs, the figures, and the numbers that we're all used to seeing about climate change have been exhausted, and I don't think can have a big impact anymore. When it came to thinking, for me, about how I can communicate my resources from Greenland, I thought about what really hit me and made me change my actions. 
For people to change, we need a personal, emotive response. For me, that's music and art. So I thought, how can we implement the same things for Greenland? Art has the power to make people see issues differently and question the way we interact. And this is something we've been putting into place in Greenland. Right now, I'd like to share some resources with you from our trip, photography and music, that hopefully sums up the issue of climate change for you. People don't understand an issue. I don't think it's because they haven't seen the science enough times. It's because the way that they engage with something hasn't come along for them yet. And for us, I think it's our duty that we can just provide as many possible ways to interact with issues as we can. But it's not just down to people like me who have been to these places and are working on these projects to do it. It is in all of our hands to do so. So I'd like to invite all of you today if you think you've been inspired by these issues, or environmental issues in general, relating to climate change, please submit your own interpretations to this address here. Through this, we can create a user-submitted database. And this is the next step in my work following the Greenland expedition. I want, we're trying to create a database that people can go to and just find the particular way that they can engage with an issue. And in doing so, engage new people with climate change for the first time. And in doing so, we can unite different nations together to create a solution. So when I think back to the past two years of what I've learned, is that climate change is acting so quickly. And whilst there might be short-term benefits, ultimately, we need to set up a sustainable future. We're past the point of no return with climate change. We can't go back on our actions. But what we can do is move forward towards a solution positively, looking for creative ways to engage more people with the issue. Currently, there have been valuable national efforts. But if we can all work together to submit our own creative interpretations, we can connect with people anywhere in the world and create a global force of shared understanding that really can combat the issue of climate change. Thank you very much.